Okay, so I'll, our next speaker is uh, Paul Curtis. He's a principal solution engineer at Mepar Technologies, and uh, he will present why containers and microservices need streaming data. A few words about Paul. Um, where at Mepar, he provides pre and post sales um, technical support. Prior to joining Mepar, Paul served as senior operation engineer for Unami, um, a startup founded to deliver. Um, on premise, um, on the premise of interactive TV for consumers, networks, and advertisers. Uh, his background extends back to the ancient personal computing days, uh, having started his first full-time pro programming job on the day of um, IBM PC was introduced. Uh, welcome, Paul. Everybody can hear me? Okay, good. Um, since I'm going to keep this very short since I am between you and lunch, okay? So the basic premise of this is very simple. In most cases, we have viewed microservices and containers and streams as separate things. Uh, some cases, I've seen a lot of customers who've combined one or two of them. What I want to show you is that actually, in combination, they work really well. They can scale very quickly. And the technologies that you use to do this uh, are pretty obvious and widely available. I would suspect that everybody in this room has touched either Kafka or Docker or Kubernetes, pretty much everybody. OK, that's good. Make it simple. So we'll start with a, a test case. This is going to be fast, because in the UK, everybody knows what the Mary Rose is. This is a warship of King Henry VIII's Navy was sunk in the Solent which is off the Isle of Wight, in 1536. In 1982, they raised Mary Rose 437 years later from the bottom of the strait. And it's housed in a museum in Portsmouth, which my colleague Leon took me to see last time I was in London. And it's very interesting because I was looking at this. And this is actually the ship that was raised from the bottom after 440 years. And I looked around, and I kind of started to notice some odd things about it. Uh, first off, that blue background, that light they put behind there is like really bright. But the second thing I noticed was there's these little white boxes all over this thing, everywhere. They're all over the ship. You can see them if you look very closely in the pictures. But I circled five or six of them. So what I, what I did is I then took a picture of one. Now, being the total geek that I am, I tried to figure out what this was. And I asked. The people at the Mary Rose Museum said this is a IoT device. What it does is it measures temperature and humidity. They put them all over the ship. And I asked, why? It's like, why do you need these things? I said, because if the humidity goes down too far, the ship will turn to dust. It will dry out and just go poof. So standing there, I'm like, OK, let's do something fun with this. How do we? take this data set and we turn it into something that we can use and we can demonstrate some technologies. So what do we need to know? We need to know when things go horribly awry. We need to know if it breaks. We want to keep the data set around for analysis, right? Long-term trend analysis and that kind of stuff. If we're building new applications, we want to be able to replay the data. So some of these kinds of requirements that we have for this very simple data pipeline apply to many, many projects. And the last one is we don't want to lose the data. Right? So how do you build this out? So we got to build this data pipeline. So we have something that collects the data. It's pretty simple. In the case, uh, actually, <laughs> very funny, I was in the British Museum this trip, and they have the same little white boxes in some of the display cases on some of the very ancient things. And apparently, I was able to get the brand name off it. The device p sends an HTTP post on a regular basis. And it reads the sensors. So you need a place to collect it. Well, that's pretty easy. We can do that. And we need to have some way to alert. Right? So, oh, humidity's gone down too high. Temperature's gone up too high. We need to alert. We want to store the data somewhere. Pretty easy. We know how that works. We wanted to keep some data trends so that we could see potentially, you know, and I'll give you an example of why you might want this. A data trend. So what if the temperature or the humidity is going down slowly? 
Not enough to trigger an alert, not a big drop, but slowly, right? That might take a week. Meanwhile, as it's going down slowly, the ship is falling apart more and more, but you're not getting alerted until finally it hits the alert and it's been dried out for 10 days and you're worse off than you were. So you want to alert on things like that. And obviously, somebody at the other end wants a beautiful dashboard with nice gauges and little graphs and all kinds of colors and buttons and all that kind of stuff. We also realize that because they want the dashboard, of course they want the alerts on the dashboard too. I mean, heaven forbid they should come in in the morning and there shouldn't be a red flashing light or something that they have to see. So we started our premise with how do we connect all this stuff together and how do we use our good technologies? So I want to make a couple of quick definitions. A microservice in our world is a self-contained thing. So if you build out Docker containers, you pretty much know that when you're done and you cast your Docker image, you have built a self-contained item. I can take that image pretty much anywhere I need to go and it will run, right? I do this on our Macs, we do this on our Linux boxes, we actually can do this on Windows now, which is a little scary. But the key thing is, is that it has no dependencies outside itself. It doesn't require anything else for that Docker container to run. So in our picture, here's our microservices, right? So we assume that these things have, will deal with data and have actions, right? They also can be self-contained pretty easily. So they become the containers. That was pretty simple, right? Hey, like there's no brain surgery here, guys. All right, then we need to connect them. So we make the next step and we say these are the streams. So all those little pipelines that go on between these containers all right, are the streams. When you look at the whole picture, this is what you get. So this is no different than what I showed you before. This is no different than any other service-oriented architecture that has been designed since Adam and Eve. Now, how many people can go back to Corba? XML, oh, well, Corba, wow, that, okay, there's a date. XML, RPC, SOA, we've all done this, HTTP, REST APIs. That's all of these things. Those are all ways to communicate between these particular uh, containers and these microservices. They all have good sides. At the time, they were the greatest thing since sliced bread. Remember, they were like, yeah, I know Corba. All right. Um, but these days, they have a couple of very distinct problems. Every one of them has a different API. Every post requires different things. Every get requires different things. So I need to maintain API documentation between every step in this process, no matter which one of these SOA technologies I was using. Didn't matter, right? Swagger, everybody knows Swagger, see, Swagger. Okay, so what is Swagger's benefit? It allows you to build a documentation and then build an API. Well, that's great, except that I'd have to do one of them for every one of these paths. Right? Or I'd have to build one big one and that Swagger doc would be like 40 pages long. Right? Streams do something that make it easy. There is one API. You publish and you consume. That's it. The microservice has to know what to do with the message and that's its responsibility. But the plumbing and the transport, the reliability of that transport, the replay of that transport, the persistence of that transport, that's all in the stream. You don't have to do that. And if I have to add a new service, I just want to tag something on there, all I have to do, all he has to know about, this guy down here, this new service, is how to consume from the stored data stream. That's all he has to know. He doesn't have to know anything about the stored the data stream. He doesn't have to know anything about any of this other stuff that's up here. This, the 40 page swagger doc that would cover that, he would know about everybody. He doesn't need to. So we can isolate and make these things independent really quickly. So why do you use streams? They have all these cool properties. API was the one I talked about. Let's talk about some of the things that are not as obvious. Streams can be replayed, which means that they can be a system of record. Streams are immutable. Everybody know what immutable is, right? Read only, cannot change. So. Those, I, I'm sure there's some financial 
uh, institution employees here. System of record in that world is a regulatory and compliance requirement. It certainly is in New York where I am. Okay? The laws here in the UK are very similar. That is actually very important. It can be replayed. If you think about it from the perspective of how do I find the rogue trade? Well, trades happen in, you know, let's take the New York Stock Exchange. Not a really big exchange. It's about 100,000 a second. You're going to tell me you're going to be able to do that and keep track of that? No, you need to be able to replay it to see what actions happened as the bid axis price were changed and when that trade occurred. And you have to see it in sequence in order to reconstruct the events that caused the problem. Okay? Streams can be replicated. How many people have struggled with disaster recovery in multiple data centers? How many people have tried to do that with a REST API? It, it, it can be done, all possible, just not easy. Streams, you just replicate the scene. Say, oh, send that stream over there. Pretty simple. All the events that appear on the source stream appear on the destination stream. And the last part is not as obvious when you look at streams independently, but when you look at them in conjunction with containers and microservices, it says we want our microservices to be what? Completely self-contained, right? That was one of our original premises. Well, if all it needs to do is listen on one stream and publish to another stream, that means they truly are isolated from each other. They don't have to know anything about the brokers. They don't have to know anything about anything other than how to consume from and publish two streams. Which means that I can truly build a container and a Docker container with a complete portion of an application, a microservice, that is, has no outside dependencies. I don't need to know the REST API anymore. All I know, all I need to know is this stream gives me this JSON record, I do this, and I take my new one and I put it over there. I need to know nothing about anything else. So it makes coding, developing, and debugging really, really easy. Right? Now what goes between the plumbing, I don't need to worry about it. I'm the developer of that microservice. And it, so this gives us three very nice alliterative ways to view streams. Persistent, persistent, they are. They can be replayed, they can be consumed. You can go back to the beginning of the stream, you can start at the end of the stream. They have a lot of features that are built into streaming technology that make it really, really nice for developers. And they cover all languages. Streams are performant. So when you go back outside, you'll see MapR has our little, little racetrack with the little cars. Okay. It's a cute demonstration. But those little cars, the, the single car, generates about 10 events a second. Each one. This is a toy that does this. Okay? So if you think about the building, is the other example I was. This is 20 stories, 20 levels in this building. There's 100 thermostats. They generate uh, a, t uh, a sensor hit every 10 seconds. So that's six per minute. Do the math. And this is one building in the city of London. Multiply that by all the buildings in the city of London. Uh, financial guys, anybody who's done real-time tech? Streams on, in this world will deal with real-time tech in real time. Okay? The laptop that we run our little car demo on, in a virtual machine, will do somewhere between 80 to 100,000 events per second. That's what performant means and they're pervasive. The last discussion, okay, with, from Hortonworks, if you take Metron and you look at what Storm does in the middle, you notice that was Kafka. Do you know why it was Kafka? Because Kafka gives you these properties, okay? And I can do event processing in Storm. The question he asked, why Storm? Storm is an event processor per event, whereas Spark Streaming is a micro-batch. Flink is an event processor, okay? You know, per, it does a, does a calculation per event. You can do that stuff with streams. You can do both of them with streams, right? Spark streaming, you like micro batches, that's cool. Do it that way. Need event processing, per tick processing, 
You can do that with Flink and Storm and you know, hundreds of others. Okay? They are everywhere. So I'm going to talk about a, a customer use case, a real customer. Um, this customer is in Europe, actually. So when I talk to the Americans, I have to explain about the Mary Rose and the history. And I don't have to do that here. It's very easy. I also don't have to tell them where Europe is. <laughs> OK, so one of the things that, that this architecture gives you is it makes it real simple to deal with a customer. This customer had some very specific things. They needed multiple data centers right off the bat. It's a consumer-facing web service. So this could be anything. This could be a bank's website. This particular one uh, was not, was actually consumer. So think about any of these applications. Multiple data centers. The Docker images had to be available and signable in both data centers equally. Okay. The streams had to appear in both data centers equally. The reason was is that if one of the data centers went offline, the other one, they would automatically load balance to the other one, and it had to be the same place at the same place in time. Okay? So it had to be real time or near real time. And the last one is they had databases on both sides that had to have master master replication. Now that's a pretty tall order, but it's not a very uncommon set of requirements. I can think of many financial applications that would need this. I can think of any consumer one that would need this, right? Banks. I mean, even simple things. Um, bus schedules. The TFL keeps track of where the buses are in London, which they did that in New York. Uh, it was very nice, but if you lose one data center, you can't, you, what are you going to stand at the stop and wait for the bus? The sign's going to go blank. You're going to be there for an hour. People get rather angry. So you don't want that. So there's reasons to have databases that can talk to each other. All right. This is what they ended up with. Now, I'm going to put down the clicker. So I'm going to talk through this a little bit. So each of the two data centers were built out relatively the same size. They weren't exactly the same. So the microservices that are in data center one, or the one on the left, okay, they had streams uh, were the plumbing between all the microservices. So these Docker hosts, and there were more than two, trust me, um, that are running in that data center, if, a, if they needed to take a Docker host offline, they could do it. If a container went down, it could restart anywhere because the streams were pervasive throughout all of the Docker hosts. In other words, if you think about Kafka, you, the, the broker IP address would have to be the same for all those containers. It would have to know exactly where it was. This is a MapR customer, and the reason they chose MapR was that we don't have a broker, so it didn't become a problem. So all the Docker containers had of our streams client in it, and all they needed to know was how to consume and produce. They didn't need to know anything about where brokers are or what they were. Right? The second data center, which had the exact same set of microservices running, okay, as it turns out, the stream that goes from, uh, from five, so container five, is the one that's replicated. Okay, the other ones were less critical. And it is done at um, the platform level. So the stream is replicated inside MapR to do that. The database is master master. They're using a JSON database. So any record inserted by uh, microservice 5 on the right side is automatically reflected in the database for microservice 5 on the left side, and vice versa. So if either one of these data centers went down, okay, all the data would be up to date. Obviously, the stream replication would stop, but who cares because the, the data center is down. You're not going to get any data from it anyway. Right? When it came back up, the stream coming out of five would replicate back to one, and it would bring it up to sync, and the tables would replicate and bring themselves up. The last thing that's not obvious here is they stored their uh, Docker images, the actual images that they ran, on the MapR file system, which was mirrored back and forth. So the same images appeared in both data centers. Now, that's a pretty straightforward discussion, but it gave them a couple of huge benefits. Besides meeting all the requirements, it meant that DevOps was very, very simple because they published their Docker images to one data center and they were mirrored to all the other ones. 
and the checksums and the MD5 sums obviously would be the same because it was the exact same file, the Docker image, and they could secure it. They could guarantee that the images that were being run in the left-hand data center were the exact same as the one in the right-hand data center. So that's their architecture. Streaming in their environment, um, they're, not, they're not really huge on the streaming as far as numbers. The event size is about 4K per event. And they're, they're doing, I don't know, half a million a second, somewhere in there. Not huge comparatively to some other things. So that's where I am. This is how you get a hold of us. You can come and see MapR and look at our pretty cars go around the track and come and get free swag. We're over around the corner. Come and visit us at lunch. Um, we, I am on Twitter, though that's not my Twitter handle. Mine is Paul underscore MapR. And then contact us by email. Um, and that's it. Are there any questions? Yes. Right. So you wouldn't do that with that you don't have to. It's built in. Right. right. So in the Kafka world, you use Kafka streams and the replication piece and from Confluent. Right. That's built into the MapR platform. So you don't have to do that. Um, and you certainly don't use Mirror Maker. No. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> any other questions? Uh, general questions on forget MapR. It could be any general question. the synchronization channel so if there is a split brain okay so the question was what would happen on a network partition between the two data centers the two data centers can act independently in our platform what happens and I'll, I'll talk about the Kafka world first um, the Kafka uh, has a sequence number per partition okay and when you replicate okay the sequence numbers are maintained across the partitions what happens is, is that you're now going to have conflicting sequence numbers from two sides. It's done last, last in. It's done in sequence. It just, even if the sequence number is the same, both events will appear. At the database level, last right wins. That's how we do it. Any other questions? It was on microservices. You said um, if you're taking the logic to a simple, simple level and just consume a JSON and produce one, is there a risk of falling into nano services? And how can you avoid that? Nano services just to have. Yeah, so this is, this is a developer's dilemma, right? Developers want to build a test. I'm, I, by the way, I'm a former developer. So I want to test. I want my unit test to be this big, OK, this big. So it takes two seconds to run. So I'm going to build a microservice surrounding my test. So my microservice has one test. That's not a realistic way to do it, because what you end up with is 10,000 microservices. What you have to do is, is go back to the business world and take it from a business perspective. Rather than looking at it as a functional thing, like this microservice equals one function in code, look at it as this microservice equals one function in a business process. Sometimes you have to break the business processes up into pieces, but that's a typical kind of rule of thumb benchmark to do that, right? Stock ticker is a classic, right? You have bid, ask, and execution. Keep it simple, right? Bids, we have one business process that watches the trends of bids. We have one business process that watches the trends of ask. And we have two business processes that watch the execution. We want to know what it is, but we also want to record the fact that it actually was executed at that price and go back and get the bid ask that preceded it. So those turn out to be probably four or five microservices and one stream. Now, they're all consuming from the same stream, right? different consumer groups, but they all are looking at the same price information. They're just doing different things with it. So that's a, is that a reasonable example? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Like I said, I'm keeping you from lunch. No? OK, well, thank you very much. Thank you, Paul.